In today's lecture, we're going to talk about cytoplasmic inheritance as well as sex linkage. Let's first focus on sex linkage. Sex is determined using a variety of mechanisms. Uh, many organisms, like humans, have X and Y chromosomes. Female is XX, male is XY. Other ones uh, have uh, the X chromosome, and the absence of a chromosome makes it female. Other ones have chromosomes called Z chromosomes. Uh, some, in or some organisms, uh, sex is determined by genes, presence or absence of genes. Other ones is determined by the ploidy. So one set of chromosomes is male, two sets is female. Um, other organisms are it's determined by the environment. And other ones, even bacterial infections, can uh, determine the sex of the organism. In humans, there's something called X inactivation. Uh, which is very interesting because when you think about it, if a human female has two X chromosomes and a male only has one X, there's a problem there because there are some genes located on the X chromosome. Either, uh, you know, women have twice as many chromosomes or, you know, so they have one too many or males have one too little. Uh, it turns out, in fact, what happens is you could sort of think of it as the females have one too many X chromosome scenario by the fact that one of the X chromosomes in females is randomly inactivated. Uh, this happens at different points in time, uh, but usually it happens uh, in very, very uh, early uh, embryonic development. And so functionally, females are hemizygous. In other words, hemizygous means only one of the chromosomes uh, is expressed. Sometimes uh, different cells in an organism's body will have different X's inactivated. So you can see these calico cats, uh, the female ones at least, uh, have different patches of fur with different patches of pigmentation. Uh, there's many female uh, inherited diseases that can be inherited on the, uh, the X chromosome. Uh, males can get them as well. Uh, but if a female has them, you could see uh, more variability in the disease because, uh, you know, one of the X's could be inactivated, one of them might not be, and this adds to variability uh, in the diseases. Right here you see an actual uh, X inactivated chromosome, something called a bar body. The manner in which, which uh, X inactivation occurs uh, you know, varies between species, but in general, uh, in humans, this is how it goes about. So what happens is um, there's two types. So there's imprinted X inactivation, uh, preferential silencing of the father's X, which is sort of interesting, uh, and there's random X inactivation. Uh, in humans, basically, we have this random X inactivation. And what happens is there are, uh, if you look at this diagram on the bottom left here, there's two X chromosomes. Uh, each X chromosome has uh, a gene located on it. So there's a gene uh, that is basically called EXIST and one that's called T6. And the way it works is when EXIST is activated, EXIST will actually silence the chromosome from which it was activated. So you have the EXIST gene, RNA is transcribed from that gene, and the RNA then silences the chromosome from which it was produced. On the other hand, if T6 is activated on that particular X chromosome first, which is basically, for the most part, the same gene just expressed in the backward direction, then what happens is uh, it prevents exist from being expressed and prevents that RNA silencing. So what are the implications of X inactivation? Well, about you know, 5 to 15% of the genes on the inactive X chromosome evade silencing, so some are still expressed, which is sort of interesting. And if we have expression of both X chromosomes, it's something termed over X inactivation. In other words, uh, this is often, often linked to abnormalities in humans, such as breast cancer. Many, many questions about X inactivation remain, however. We don't totally understand it. In other words, there are females um, that uh, suffer from a disease called uh, Turner syndrome, oh, excuse me, uh, on the left there, and they're usually shorter in statue, stature, uh, and they have some uh, different proportions uh, than you typically expect. And uh, these women only have one X chromosome, which you would think would not be a problem since the other one is silenced anyway. But in fact, uh, these women often are sterile and there are some implications uh, with this. On the right, you see a male who is XXY, uh, a male who has something called um, um, Kleinfelter syndrome. And with this, uh, what happens is, uh, you, again, you would think, well, there wouldn't be a problem because the male has too many X's, but at least he has a Y, right? Uh, which will you know, make him male, but uh, one of the X's should be inactivated, so it's not a problem. But in reality, what happens, again, is we result in this uh, abnormality. 
So uh, the mechanism behind these are not fully understood to date. So there are still some mysteries that remain among the inactivated X. So sex chromosomes don't follow Mendel's rules for inheritance, which is sort of interesting. So in 1910, Thomas Hunt Morgan discovered sex linkage in fruit flies, and we term him hence the father of fruit fly genetics. Uh, what he saw was a white-eyed male in a population of red-eyed flies, which is very interesting. So what he did was he set up these crosses. So he crossed a red-eyed female, so uh, with a, a wild female, with a white male. And what he saw was all the F1 offspring were wild. The F2 offspring ratio, uh, phenotypic ratio, was three red to one white. But all the white-eyed flies were male. This is really something that Mendel would not have expected. So, very interesting. What if he did the reciprocal cross? Here what he found was, he found that he crossed a white-eyed female with a red-eyed male, so wild male. All the females had red eyes, all the males had white eyes. But in the F2, he got a very interesting ratio. So we got half wild, half white, and then again, half of the wild were female, half were male, half of the white were female, half of the white were male. So this is really not what Mendel would expect at all. Something very, very different. So what was going on here? Well, what Thomas Hunt Morgan discovered was that there was uh, X linkage. So the white gene was actually located on the X chromosome. Uh, the same rules that you normally do for producing gametes and doing cr uh, crosses pertain. Uh, but here you could see that as you do the cross and you go through the generations, you could see that um, the fact that females have two X's and males only have one basically uh, leads to this you know, abnormal ratio that you would not typically expect. There's many types of uh, inheritance patterns that are X-linked recessive. And so what this means is you need two copies of the recessive allele to show the defect. And so when you think of that, uh, what you see for males is what you see is what you get. In other words, there's only one X chromosome. There's one allele on it. So if the male has a homozygous, or excuse me, has a recessive allele, then he will show that recessive abnormality where females can actually be carriers. So here's some uh, bullet points about recessive uh, inheritance through the X-linked uh, method. An example of this in humans is hemophilia, uh, which the royal family in England uh, has uh, you know, uh, been susceptible to, so it's very interesting. There's also X-linked dominant inheritance patterns as well. Here you only need one copy of the abnormal allele. Here's some bullets as far as X-linked dominant inheritance goes. So uh, it affects both sexes, but more often females. You might say, why more often? Because they have two shots at having the abnormal gene, and all they need is one copy of it. Um, some other interesting things. Affected males pass it on to all of their daughters, but none of their sons. And females may be more mildly or variably affected than males. There's another type of inheritance pattern called cytoplasmic inheritance, and this is very interesting. So in cytoplasmic inheritance, uh, inheritance is passed on through mitochondria or chloroplasts. Uh, when we talk about uh, humans, we're obviously just talking about mitochondria, since humans don't have chloroplasts. And it's very interesting because uh, the endosymbiotic theory says that mitochondria are actually bacteria that eukaryotic cells engulf. So the mitochondria, uh, the DNA from the mitochondria is circular. Uh, and um, mitochondria actually uh, replicate their DNA uh, independent of the genomic DNA replication. Another interesting fact is that mitochondria are passed on from mother to child, mother to child, uh, as they're transmitted in the egg. And in a sense, they're passed on from mo mother to daughter, mother to daughter. We're talking about generations, right? Because if it's passed from mother to son, you could tell that in that generation, uh, or sorry, in that lineage, uh, the abnormality will not persist because the sun cannot pass it on further. So really it's something used to track um, you know, uh, inheritance abnormalities from mothers uh, through their daughters, through the generations. Whenever you have uh, cytoplasmic inheritance, you're talking about a pedigree, you can note that because you'll see that the abnormality, whenever it hits a male, it stops. It doesn't go through the generations because they cannot pass it on. Whenever you see the abnormality persist, you know the shaded uh, circles or squares, it's only persisting through the female lineage. 
Another thing that's very interesting is that each cell has multiple mitochondria. So uh, the abnormality can be homoplasmic. In other words, all the mitochondria in a cell could be affected. It could be a very severe phenotype. Or it could be heteroplasmic, meaning that only some of the mitochondria are affected, some are not. And you have a more variable uh, phenotypic expression of the abnormality. This shows that concept uh, on the previous slide, just in the pictorial method. Another thing that uh, is very interesting to note is when you look at these pedigrees, uh, you could also note that this is um, cytoplasmic inheritance by the fact that you see some uh, figures that are totally darkened, but then some that are shaded. And so the shaded figures really are shaded uh, because they're showing individuals uh, you know, that, that are somewhat affected by this abnormality. Again, probably because uh, they're uh, heteroplasmic.